uh, Professor Benjamin Van Wright from Stanford. Uh, and Professor uh, Benjamin Van Roy uh, is a professor at Stanford, where he has served on the faculty since 1998, and he has been a pioneer in reinforcement learning, and his research currently focuses on the design, analysis, and application of reinforcement learning algorithms. And beyond academia, he leads a DeepMind research team in Mountain View, and he's also a fellow of INFORMS and IHPE. And, uh, yeah, so during this talk, feel free to ask any questions. You can either uh, type the questions in the chat box and then I'll read them out, or you can directly unmute yourself and ask the questions. So um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Benjamin Van Roy. Well, thank you for uh, having me. Um, so <clears throat> uh, this talk uh, is on recent uh, uh, work I did with uh, Shi Dong. And, and when I say with here, I mean Shi Dong did most of the work um, that I get to talk about it today. So, um, so reinforcement learning uh, has demonstrated impressive successes in simulated uh, environments. Um, the, uh, the trend is to tackle increasingly uh, complex simulated environments these days. Um, and, and the success stories tend to involve massive simulations that generate enormous amounts of data that could take millions or billions of years of equivalent real-time interactions. Uh, major advances in data efficiency are needed to transfer the success to real environments. Um, this uh, cartoon plot uh, was produced by a friend of mine who's a roboticist, uh, Martin Reedmiller. Uh, he plays with uh, reinforcement learning agents and he drew this to illustrate how long state-of-the-art reinforcement learning agents take to develop competence in the simplest of robotics tasks like stacking blocks. Uh, the point uh, he was trying to make here is that it takes about a, a year of real-time operation with a real robot, with a real robotic hand to gain any reasonable level of competence. <clears throat> so um, in this talk, I'll share some thoughts on uh, designing uh, efficient agents. And, <clears throat> and in particular, I'm gonna focus on the issue of how to design agents uh, for which data requirements do not scale with environment complexity. <clears throat> the idea is that you know, if we keep scaling up environment complexity, at some point, uh, the environment has to be much more complex than the agent. And, and we want to design agents in a way that uh, don't have to be as complex in the environment, but yet uh, 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 can, can uh, realize reasonable performance in reasonable time. All right, so this is uh, how I think about reinforcement learning these days. Um, you have an agent and you have an environment, and, and this is the interface between them. <clears throat> so the agent uh, executes an action at each time and registers an observation that the environment spits back. And this is the only interaction between the agent and the environment. Uh, for this talk, to keep things simple, let's assume that the action set and observation sets are, are, are finite. Um, and so at each time, the agent has to execute an action from the set A script. And then the agent registers an observation from O script. Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll denote the history uh, by HT. Uh, that's everything the agent has experienced, all the interaction up to time T. And so that's a, a sequence of actions and observations uh, up, to, up to that time. Um, one thing to note is, uh, you know, this picture doesn't make any Markovity or episodicity assumptions. And I'm gonna avoid uh, such assumptions uh, here. Um, in my view, those assumptions are really meant to restrict the environment to uh, didactic uh, special cases. Um, and it's emphasized in the literature because, uh, because it's, it, it's sort of nice to consider special cases in order to develop some insight. 
but really the agent environment interface is just action observation. There's no notion of uh, Markovity or episodicity uh, inherent to that. All right, so here's an example of, of uh, you know, what you might apply an agent to. Uh, you could consider a dialogue system where, you know, the agent uh, uh, selects an action and, and the space of actions is, is, is a space of uh, messages of some length. So, so the agent could say, how can I help you? Uh, the environment could spit back an observation uh, and, and this kind of interaction could continue uh, over time. And, and that's, that's the agent environment interaction. Um, or you could consider a queuing network where you know, the agent produces actions that influence services, ser server assignments and, uh, and the environment spits back uh, observations that have to do with queue lengths. Um, or you, know, you can imagine the internet and the, inter the agent interfacing with the internet uh, through a typical uh, computer interface, keyboard and, and, uh, uh, and mouse, let's say and screen um, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, an action could be, for example, a keystroke and uh, the observation could be the screenshot. And, you know, you could design an agent to achieve certain things uh, through such interactions. Uh, for example, you could design an agent to uh, educate uh, people about something or, uh, or to um, uh, identify uh, or to fact check news and, uh, and tag news appropriately or, or any num number of other things. But, but when we move to an agent uh, that works in this, uh, in, 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 with, with, with say something like the internet, um, uh, it's clear that the agent complexity is gonna be much smaller than the environment complexity. There's gonna be so much going on in, in the environment, which is the internet in this case, that the agent can't keep track of everything and, and it's gonna be, embody something much simpler than, than the environment it's interacting with. <clears throat> All right, so reinforcement learning is about uh, agent design, how to design such an agent. And, um, and, and the idea is to design an agent that operates effectively given an agent environment interface. Um, and, and one might ask, is it possible to, to, to design an, an agent that's reasonably efficient uh, across a very broad range of environments, and uh, with uh, with the with the uh, notion that environment complexity uh, far exceeds agent complexity. Okay, so today's talk, uh, in today's talk, um, in in order to ground things and 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 be concrete about this, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a very simple agent, a particular, very simple agent that is designed for um, the case where the environment is much more complex than the agent. And, uh, and, and the agent in order Google. to... Sorry? Okay. May, may I ask a question about the environment? Sure. So is, is the, are you considering that the environment needs to be static or it can change over time, for example, the environment? Uh, I'm not assuming anything about the environment. So, so, so just a follow-up question. So usually a problem with uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning is that uh, the, the environment is changing because the actions of the other agents. But in this case where you are considering your agents as keeping the states, then we could consider that we could apply this in this, in this setup, could be applied to multi-agent reinforcement learning. Sure, um, so the way I'm thinking about this is I'm designing one agent to interact with the environment. The environment could include many other agents. Right? I'm not making any assumption about the environment. So, so the environment could include a hundred other agents or a billion other agents or anything for that matter, right? Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, I had a yes. quick query uh, regarding uh, agent state. So uh, uh, here it's uh, algorithmic, uh, editoric, and uh, epistemic uh, state that we are uh, talking about. Yep. Okay, cool, thanks. 
So, so, so the, yeah, so the agent tracks an agent state. So the idea is the agent has to work with bounded memory and bounded computation per time step. So it can't retain and keep processing the entire history. Right? Instead, it tracks something simpler uh, in, 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 in the agent state. It captures everything that the agent is keeping track of. It uh, represents a simplifying lens into, into the complex environment and allows the agent to operate with limited memory and computation per time step. Um, and the, the particular algorithm we're gonna use uh, in this agent is optimistic queue learning. And, um, and what we'll uh, establish uh, is, is that, uh, is that you can, you, that the eventual performance can be bounded uh, based on how well um, aleatoric state can predict value. So, so uh, aleatoric state is, in my uh, parlance, is part of agent state. It's something that, uh, the, that the agent is keeping track of in order to uh, uh, represent what it thinks its situation in the environment is. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so in terms of data requirements, like how long does it take to get to this eventual level of performance? Well, um, well, the idea is that, uh, 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 you know, the, we'll, we'll, we'll share a result that, that, that shows that the data requirements grow with complexity of the aleatoric state dynamics, but not with any other notion of complexity having to do with the environment dynamics. Okay, so the point here is agent state, aleatoric state are things going on in the mind of the agent. And, 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 and what we want is the agent to be able to learn to behave effectively, um, you know, in time that is driven by complexity of that, not complexity of the true environment. Okay, so a few disclaimers. Um, first of all, uh, I do not recommend uh, application of this agent. It is not meant to be a practical agent. Uh, just looking at it, you'll see that it can be improved in many ways. Um, however, it serves as a constructive proof for, for the result they'll share um, and a sanity check that, that is possible to design agents that in some sense uh, uh, can be much simpler <clears throat> than the environment, but still uh, do reasonably well. However, you know, that, that disclaimer applies to a lot of theoretical work in reinforcement learning, probably most of it. Um, but, but the relevance of the particular agent I'll describe extends a bit further. It's not purely just a constructive proof because, you know, uh, ideas surrounding Q learning uh, are related to how successful agents are designed. Um, and, uh, and, so, and so there seems to be some uh, re relation to, uh, to practical agent design here. Um, so, if, you know, for example, if you look at uh, the Mu Zero agent, which is considered a state-of-the-art agent and is described in a recent paper in Nature um, that uses, you know, ideas of uh, value equivalence and temporal differences and all that. And, and so, so, so Q learning captures uh, some, some elements of that as well. Um, but, uh, but, but because, because of, of the relation to, to uh, state-of-the-art agents, um, perhaps uh, the simple agent I'm going to describe today um, you know, uh, offers an avenue to building a bridge between theory and practice. And, uh, and maybe you know, if we go in this direction, we can uh, offer some principled guidance for uh, design of, of, of real agents. All right. Um, Okay, so here's my outline. We talk about agent state reward and policies uh, first. Then I'll continue uh, by sharing with you results about the performance of, uh, of, of the agent without even telling you about the agent, what the agent is yet. Then I'll tell you what the agent is, which is this optimistic Q learning thing. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go through some open issues. Okay, so agent state. Agent state is everything the agent retains in memory. And, and um, all the uh, 
you know, agents I know of organize agent states into three parts. <clears throat> There's algorithmic state, aleatoric state, and epistemic state. And the algorithmic state is a stuff unrelated to the environment. Uh, in the particular agent I'm going to uh, uh, study today, uh, the algorithmic state it consists only of the time that right? the agent keeps track of how long it's been since it started. Uh, the aleatoric state is meant to uh, uh, represent the situation, agent situation in the environment. Um, and for our agent, uh, the agent will be endowed with a function f that it uses to update the aleatoric state. So the idea is uh, in, in within the mind of the agent, it says, gosh, my, my current state is st. I just took action at. I observed ot plus one in response. <clears throat> and so I'm going to apply this function f, which is uh, in my mind, to generate st plus one. And that's going to be my next aleatoric state. Finally, there's an epistemic state, which represents knowledge about the environment. And, um, and uh, for our agent, uh, which is this optimistic Q learning algorithm, uh, the epistemic state will have uh, two parts to it. One is an action value function, QT. Uh, the other is a set of uh, state action counts, CT. Okay, so QT uh, predicts optimal values and CT tells you how many times you've seen that state action pair. And, um, and you know, of course, these, <clears throat> these uh, objects will be updated over time. But, uh, but when I talk about the, the optimistic Q learning uh, algorithm, uh, that will, you know, uh, specify how these things are updated. All right. Uh, <clears throat> given these uh, three components of the agent state, um, it's natural to think of multiple uh, classes of policies. Okay, so, so as we talk about policies, there's three classes we'll be interested in. One is the policies that map histories to action. Then there's policies that map agent state to action. And then there's policies that map aleatoric state to action. So, um, so uh, you know, any, any policy has to map history to action because that's all we, uh, you know, all the agencies, you know, there's nothing else to, uh, to, to, to map to action. So, so a, such a policy pi assigns a probability to each action uh, given uh, the history HT. Uh, a smaller class of policies, a subset of those uh, are the policies that generate actions based on agent state. And, and there, you know, the policy uh, only depends on history through uh, agent state. Uh, finally, um, there are policies that depend on history only through aleatoric state, uh, ST. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and, and eight, since aleatoric state is part of agent state, uh, any policy that depends on history through, through aleatoric state also, also uh, only depends on history through agent state. All right, let's talk about rewards. Um, so, the agent is also endowed with a function r, little r, that it uses to assess uh, rewards. Um, so rewards characterize uh, the, the designer's preferences, the agent designer's preferences. Um, and uh, reward depends on history only through uh, agent state. Um, okay, so so. The way to think about this is the, the agent has in its mind these two functions, little r and little f, and um, and little r is used to assess rewards, and little f is used to update the aleatoric state. Okay, uh, an important concept is average reward, defined in this way: lambda pi is the average reward of policy pi. Mm, uh, just a quick uh, query: uh, What's the epsilon here? Sorry, what? Oh, oh, epsilon, I'm sorry, that's script E. Script E okay. is uh, my symbol for the environment. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I think my daughter's making a smoothie in the next room. Okay, uh, I don't know if you hear the blender going. All right, so um, policies of interest. 
So, uh, so there's the um, a few policies that you know uh, that we'll refer to. One is the optimal policy, pi star. Okay, pi star uh, is the policy that's best among all policies, you know, allowed to depend on all of history. Okay, and uh, and lambda pi star therefore is the supremum over all policies of lambda pi, and you know all these notation lambda star for that. Um, then um, there's the uh, the agent policy. This is uh, you know what the agent does. So the agent selects actions based on agent state, and so this is just an articulation of the probabilities the agent assigns to various actions uh, condition and agent state. Okay, and, and there's a, uh, of course, an average reward for that, lambda pi agent. And then there's um, a target policy, pi target. Okay, um, and, and the, the target policy I uh, define as the policy that is optimal among those that select actions based on aleatoric state. Okay, so so it's it's the best policy in that uh, that uh, those that are in the green ellipse. Okay, so so it's not as good as the optimal policy pi star because it's uh, restricted to uh, policies that can only uh, depend on history through aleatoric state. Mm, so the uh, target policy will uh, define the. Uh, no. A most optimal path. I'm sorry. Uh, the target policy here will uh, define the most optimal path, uh, in a sense. Yeah, most optimal. Ah, uh, uh, because uh, you said the optimal po policy is comprised of uh, the uh, um, bigger uh, ellipse. So I was thinking of a target policy uh, uh, that. Here uh, you have uh, defined it as a supremum. It's it's the uh, lower bound of uh, the uh, subset of uh, policies that can be taken based on that uh, green bubble that that we have, right? Yeah. So pi target is the best in the green ellipse, and pi yeah. star is the best in the blue ellipse. Ah, okay. So uh, uh, no, uh, pi target can also okay uh, be a subset of yeah okay thank you all right. thanks all right so let me talk about the agent as a black box here so 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 the way i want to think about this agent is it's a piece of software okay it's a piece of software and and that piece of software you know you uh, need to initialize it with a few uh, parameters and then you can let it loose on the environment and have it do its thing, okay? And um, and so so what I want to talk about is what the agent requires at initialization. Okay, so so the agent um, uh, is initialized with a few things. One is a set of actions. Another is a set of observations. Another is a set of aleatoric states. Then there's uh, the um, aleatoric state update function, F. And then there's um, an initial state, S0. Um, and finally, um, there's a reward function, R. Okay, And I'm assuming that the um, range of R is the unit interval. Okay, so, so you feed the agent uh, with these things, and then uh, that's all it requires. This is a piece of software, those are the inputs. And then once it has those inputs, you, you can uh, let it loose and it uh, executes actions and registers observations from the environment and it just keeps going like that. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the picture here. There's, there's no other requirements or inputs to the agent, just this black box that takes those inputs. All right, and 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 you know we think of what the agent's doing as following an agent policy, but that's just a uh, abstract representation of uh, how the agent's uh, selecting actions. It's, uh, pi agent is whatever the agent's doing. 
All right, any questions about that? All right. Okay, let's talk about the performance of the agent that I'm gonna describe. Um, okay, so we're gonna assess performance in terms of regret. Here's how I'm gonna define regret. Okay, regret is this for today. Regret at time capital T is the sum up through time T minus one of the optimal reward, the maximum reward minus uh, the realized reward, the maximum average reward minus the realized reward. Okay. So, um, so if you if you look at the asymptotic performance, uh, well, we'll think of that in terms of uh, the limit of regret divided by time. Um, and, and that just gives you lambda star minus lambda pi agent. Right? That's the difference between the uh, optimal average award and the average award achieved by the agent. Okay, so, so we can look at these two metrics, uh, regret and, and it's, uh, it's asymptotic uh, average. All right. Um, an important concept in uh, in in the uh, bound well I'll, I'll present is a this notion of a re reward averaging time. A reward averaging time is, um, you know, is needed because um, the idea is that an agent can only learn to do well if it can quickly assess and compare policies. In a sense, we need to make, you know, in order for an agent to have any hope in an environment, it needs to be able to do A-B testing between policies. Otherwise, it can't get started. And in order to do that kind of A-B testing, it needs to be able to compute an estimate of the average award of a policy. Okay, okay so, so, so the reward averaging time here uh, that I'm gonna use is, is uh, represents how long it, you know, is meant to uh, help us uh, identify how long it takes to get an expected average within epsilon uh, starting at any history. Okay, and what we'd like to say is, gosh, for each policy pi, there's a reward averaging time tau pi, <clears throat> such that I'll be able to get my expected average reward within epsilon, uh, in time tau pi over epsilon. Okay, so tau pi is meant to capture that. And, and here's a, a precise definition we use in order to capture that concept. Okay, so tau pi is our reward averaging time. All right, um, then uh, another concept that, uh, that is important is discounted value. Uh, the discounted value of policy pi is given here. So um, this is you know, the value function of V pi of policy pi with a discount factor gamma evaluated at history H. Okay, so given a history H, <clears throat> you can uh, define the uh, expected discounted future reward starting at that history. Okay, and that's a v pi, v pi gamma H. Now, now, uh, um. Yep. Ask I have a question. So sure. uh, can I understand that this V pi, uh, this value function here, is related to the agent and not to the whole uh, problem? Like it's not related to the environment itself, but to the agent. Is that correct? No, no, this is, this is related to the environment. So a follow-up question is in the case where you would have, let's say two agents in the environment and both are like its action with its own agent states, then this V function, it would be get information of both agents. Well, you can, you can have whatever you want in that cloud that's the environment. But whatever you have in that cloud that's, that's the environment, there exists probabilities of what's going to happen next condition on the history, right? Uh, the agent may not know those probabilities, right? But, but those probabilities, I mean, 
you can define probabilities, what's going to happen next condition on, uh, on the history. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's just a characterization of uh, dynamics of the environment, right? But, but, but that comes up without loss of generality. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so, so when you look at this uh, discounted value function, um, uh, you know, the discount factor can be thought of as specifying an effective horizon, right, over which this value prediction um, um, is meant to uh, uh, capture uh, future rewards. And that effective horizon is one over one minus gamma, right? Uh, that, that, that's sort of an intuitive notion of an effective horizon associated with the discount factor gamma. Uh, we also have an optimal discounted value function, V star gamma, right? That's just a supremum over all policies of V pi gamma, right? And again, as, as, as the earlier question uh, pointed to, uh, the agent doesn't know any of this, right? This is just our abstract uh, uh, analysis that comes without any loss of generality of uh, the nature of environment dynamics. Right? Um, all right. Our agent is going to try to predict discounted value and in doing so, it uses the aleatoric state as a predictor. And to understand how that works, uh, one approach is to think of aleatoric states as inducing an aggregation of histories, okay? So given any history, right, with the agent's uh, aleatoric state update function, given the history, you end up at some state after observing that history. Okay, let's call that state S of H. Okay, so, so each history maps to an aleatoric state. And, and uh, the agent's gonna consider value functions that predict future return based on aleatoric state. Okay, so, so here's a picture. Suppose, you know, the orange ellipse represents all possible histories. Uh, and so some history H is in that space. Um, and, and, and the space is partitioned into cells, each cell representing uh, one agent state, uh, sorry, one uh, aleatoric state. So, that, so what happens is if you have two histories, H and H prime in the same cell uh, uh, in this picture, uh, they, they result in the same aleatoric state. Okay, so, so in this manner, you can think of uh, aleatoric states as partitioning the space of histories, okay? And, and, and the, what the agent's gonna do is try to predict value as a function of aleatoric state, right? And as such, it has to generate the same prediction for H and H prime, okay? So, so there's a set of functions that the agent might be able to represent uh, that, are, that predict value based on uh, aleatoric state, right? And if you think of them as functions of history, right? They're functions of history that are, you know, in a sense, piecewise constant uh, in the sense that uh, within any cell of the partition, uh, the value has to be uh, identical across histories. Uh, uh, just a quick uh, query about the partition state. So uh, these partitions are um, defined as a, a, a differential uh, uh, programming uh, uh, setup uh, in which those partitions are uh, 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 or cut according to the previous uh, uh, differential uh, uh, features that uh, or uh, the uh, dynamic programming kind of environment. I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, I had a query with respect to the partition states and. Uh, how they are uh, formulated. Okay, so the agent has an aleatoric state update function f. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the agent starts with some initial aleatoric state s0. Okay, mm -hmm. then the agent takes an action a0 mm -hmm. 
and then it observes O1. Okay, given that triple aleatoric state action observation, the function f allows it to compute the next aleatoric state, S1. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it continues this way. Okay, so, so you could think of any history as leading to an aleatoric state, right? Mm -hmm. But by updating uh, uh, recursively in this way and until the current time, the history maps to an aleatoric state, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to illustrate with this orange uh, ellipse is a set of all histories. And you could think of aleatoric state and the way it's updated as inducing a partition in the space of histories, right? Because it's like there's like a many to one mapping between histories and aleatoric states. Hmm. Does that help? Yep, uh, got it, thanks. Yeah, also sorry to interject. Uh, so we are already behind in time. So I guess unless for really quick questions, we can maybe save the questions until the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so this other concept I need to define is a fidelity of aleatoric states. So the way to think about it is um, within the space of functions that predict that generate predictions based only on uh, only on um, aleatoric state, you can ask uh, how well can you predict the uh, optimal discounted value function v star gamma, right? Okay, so so that that's a measure of fidelity. That's that's how well the aleatoric states can predict optimal value. Okay, uh, and I'm doing this with respect to the maximum norm here. Okay, and then, and then I'm gonna, you know, I didn't tell you what the discount factor gamma is, but, uh, but what I'm gonna require is that, you know, we take a supremum over discount factors that, uh, that are associated with sufficiently long averaging horizons. Okay, so, so what's the sufficiently long averaging horizon? Well, there's the averaging time of the target policy, tau pi target. Okay, that's how long it takes to, uh, you know, that, that characterizes how long it takes to, um, you know, figure out how good the target policy is given uh, realized rewards. Um, and and uh, we're, we're gonna take the supremum over all effective horizons that are that long or longer. Okay, and I'm gonna call this the fidelity of aleatoric state. Okay, it's like a sort of like how it measures uh, how poorly, you, how, how well or poorly you can predict uh, for all sufficiently long horizons. Uh, if your predictions are, have to be based on aleatoric state. Uh, so the uh, discount factor is also taken in here? Uh, the discount factor is taken in where? Ah, uh, uh, but in this main uh, result, the uh, fidelity? I'm taking supremum over discount factors that yield sufficiently long horizons. Oh, okay, but thanks. The supremum there, right? Hmm. Okay, so here's the regret bound. Uh, and there's three terms in, in this regret bound. Uh, there's a persistent term. And what I mean by that is it scales with uh, capital T so that no matter how long you go, you operate for, the agent operates for, uh, you know, it's, it's experiencing some loss in every time step. Then there's a transient term here that grows slower than T. Uh, and then there's a term I'm not gonna talk about because it's dominated by the other terms. Uh, okay, so a few remarks about this that, are, that I find interesting. One is that there's no dependence on the number of environment states in this bound. Uh, there's no notion of number of environment states here. There's only number of, um, you know, there's number of, uh, uh, aleatoric states, there's number of actions, uh, and there's the averaging time for the uh, target policy, which you know, the target policy is one that selects actions based on an, an aleatoric state. So inherently it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that should generally uh, grow with the complexity of the environment or necessarily grow with the complexity of the environment. Um, okay, so there's no other dependence on the environment complexity. And, and another thing to note here is if you take the, uh, uh, asymptotic performance, right? The limit of a regret divided by time, which is the same as taking lambda star minus lambda pi agent. 
uh, that this bound implies that that is less than 15 times the fidelity delta. Okay, so that's sort of the average loss you get uh, with this agent because uh, you're trying to uh, do something much simpler than uh, than than uh, than the environment. All right. Um, so more about this asymptotic performance. Um, I should mention that um, there's uh, an old result uh, that suggests that the, the that the bound it ought to be possible with this kind of algorithm to get uh, within two delta instead of fifteen delta. So that sort of remained a gap there that that that, that might need to be addressed. Um, but, but that work also suggests that for, for the kind of bound we're talking about here, that's the best you can do. You can't do any better than two delta if you have an agent that's trying to converge on uh, some target policy that uh, is generating prediction, that's based on generating predictions uh, uh, that depend on history only through uh, aleatoric state. Okay, so, 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 so in some sense, uh, uh, there's, there's a gap here, but, uh, but, but, but this linear scaling in delta is, uh, is essential. Um, Another kind of interesting thing is I've been thinking for some time about how to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, a policy that is guaranteed to be within a, a, a linear, uh, within a linear uh, factor of delta. And, and for years I, I hadn't been able to do that. So, 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 and this includes reinforcement learning and approximate dynamic programming algorithms. So, so even if I tell you exactly what the environment is, you know, it wasn't clear to me before how to get a policy that that, that is uh, that works this well. Um, and, and you know, and, and there's old approximate dynamic programming papers that study these sorts of things, uh, but all the algorithms uh, and, and and bounds that they produce, um, you know, uh, involve quantities like delta, but typically multiplied by something like a mixing time of the environment. And so, so, so you know, an essential development here is that doing some kind of queue learning uh, gets rid of that mixing time dependence. Um, okay. So another concept that uh, comes to play here is uh, an epsilon uh, learning time. Let me define the epsilon learning time as a time capital T uh, <clears throat> that's, su that's sufficient for the expected average reward to come with an epsilon of the ultimate average reward lambda pi agent. Okay, so this is how long it takes to get close to the ultimate average reward. Um, and, and one thing our regret bound implies is that this epsilon learning time right, is polynomial in the number of agent, the number of aleatoric states, the number of actions, the <clears throat> reward averaging time of the target policy and one over epsilon. Okay, so again, uh, this is sort of how long it takes to get to uh, to get the, the level of performance that is uh, what we uh, will get in steady state. And, uh, and interestingly, it doesn't depend on any other notion of environment complexity. Okay, and, and this is important because, you know, with a really complex environment, the environment mixing time could effectively be infinite. Okay, now I should mention that uh, if the aleatoric state is the environment state, right? In that case, there's a, there's a significant literature on uh, with related results, um, uh, spearheaded by uh, Kearns and Singh in 2002, um, and, and with a lot of uh, subsequent work uh, under the uh, label of efficient reinforcement learning with tabular MDPs. Okay, so so all that work can be thought of as a special case of this where um, this formulation, where um, the uh, aleatoric state is the environment state. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, our work and algorithm is closest to uh, that of uh, uh, Jin uh, and uh, that of Wei's uh, recent work and, and some of our, uh, um, some of the proof techniques we use, uh, some of the ingredients, uh, uh, um, are uh, leverage uh, Jin's analysis 
uh, though that analysis was, you know, of course, for this case where aleatoric state equals environment state, but additionally, uh, where you know uh, the environment is episodic, uh, with uh, with a fixed uh, episode uh, uh, duration. Okay, so let me talk a bit about uh, how the agent works. Uh, the agent uh, does optimistic Q learning. Um, and there's two things the agent's updating as its epistemic state, basically. It's updating you know, what it knows about the environment uh, through these two objects, the uh, action value function and the counts. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, to understand the algorithm, you know, the agent keeps repeating the following loop. Um, it selects uh, the action AT uh, to be greedy with respect to the current action value function QT. Okay, so given its aleatoric state ST, it selects an action that maximizes QT. And then um, when, when, when it, uh, the environment spits back the observation OT plus one, the agent updates the aleatoric state and gets ST plus one from that. Um, then, you know, the agent needs to update its epistemic state, QT and CT. And so, if, you know, first uh, we just uh, let QT plus one and CT plus one be identical to QT and CT, although we'll update particular uh, uh, components of that. Um, for uh, the state action pair uh, we just experienced, we uh, increment that value by one. And uh, we do Q learning here to uh, update the um, action value for the state action pair we just saw. Um, so alpha is a uh, step size sequence indexed by uh, the uh, count CT. Um, oh, and the count should be evaluated at STAT. That's a typo, not little s a, but STAT. And, and then um, that Q value uh, used in the update, little Q, um, you know, is reward plus discount factor times the action value at the next time step, uh, plus uh, an optimistic boost, beta divided by the square root of the count. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, 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 just a quick query uh, with respect to the count. So intuitively, this count can uh, also be thought of as a uh, uh, sharpness uh, a bound that uh, helps in um, increasing the uh, sharpness of that particular uh, uh, action uh, state that we're trying to uh, evaluate? It has to do with concentration. Basically, if you have a lot of data mm -hmm. and the count is large, mm -hmm. and you don't need to be too optimistic because you're, you're confident that in what you're okay. doing with a lot of data. Okay. Oh, 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 okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I haven't given all the details, but there are a few more here that are essential to getting the particular technical result we're talking about. <clears throat> so first, we initialize counts at zero and initialize the action value function with all actions, with all, so with all values equal to one over one minus gamma, the discount factor. Um, second is the step size sequence takes this form. Uh, as a function of k, uh, and, and, and the step size sequence depends on the discount factor. Finally, uh, the particular agent we have, and this is a very synthetic element of the agent, it occasionally increases the discount factor and uh, the uh, coefficient beta using the optimistic boost in a particular way. It occasionally increases those. And when it does, uh, it also resets uh, the action value function and the counts to uh, you know, zero and one over one minus the new discount factor. Now, if you do all this uh, in a way that's carefully specified in, in our paper, uh, you get the regret bound I, I mentioned earlier. All right, okay, so that's uh, the agent. As you can see, it's very simple and it's, uh, it's a few tweaks on, uh, on Q-learning. Okay, let me talk about some open issues. One is uh, improving the bound. Um, can we improve this asymptotic performance? Uh, probably, and uh, hopefully uh, it's possible to match 
what's suggested by this 2006 paper that I wrote. Uh, and um, <clears throat> beyond that, the bound is just really loose uh, and the agent is not great. So for example, um, this t to the four fifths looks really bad and can probably be improved a lot. Um, and a particularly interesting direction for research here, I think, is to take the practical tricks that are used in designing real RL agents that, uh, that seem to be successful and see if those tricks uh, can uh, improve the agent and, and this bound. And, 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 and I think that's particularly interesting because that could generate some insight that could feed back into uh, refining how agents are designed. All right, so there's many other directions uh, that, are, that I think are interesting. Uh, one that I think is particularly promising is, um, is to study such agents through lens of information theory. <clears throat> and over the weekend, uh, some collaborators and I point, posted a, uh, posted a uh, paper on archive about this view. Uh, the paper is called Reinforcement Learning Bit by Bit. But I think this lens allows much more elegant analysis, uh, better regret bounds, uh, uh, more uh, practical agent designs based on theory. And so, so I think this is quite promising, uh, but there's a lot of uh, theory to be sorted out here. And, and, uh, and so, 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 so uh, we're, just at the, we're just at the beginnings of this. <clears throat> Okay, uh, another uh, uh, element that's missing from the agent I described is, you know, it's sort of obvious that to design a data efficient agent, you want to be learned, the agent should be learning from more than rewards. Uh, the agent I described is, is, is wired to adjust its epistemic state based only on reward feedback. And you know, there's so much other feedback from the environment and it's kind of silly to just adjust based on reward feedback. Um, finally, uh, you know, the agent I described is sort of anchored to this view of trying to converge on some uh, action value function. And, um, and in a really complex environment, it's actually probably not better not to converge. Right. What you want to do is uh, have some kind of tracking where, you know, given the agent's limited capacity in its mind, it wants to somehow specialize its resources to uh, things that are relevant in the, in the, com in the near future uh, and, and be able to adjust that over time uh, in doing some, some kind of tracking as opposed to uh, having step sizes going to zero, hoping to converge on something. All right, um, finally, uh, it's kind of strange to me that the agent is based on discounted uh, Q learning when there's no real discount factor inherent in my formulation of the agent environment interaction uh, or in my formulation of the agent preferences. And so, so there are average reward versions of Q learning and, 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 and such algorithms may lead to a more natural uh, agent design and one particularly elegant uh, uh, average uh, reward Q-learning uh, algorithm is, is in this uh, recent paper by Wen, Wen, Nick, and Sutton. Okay, so there's too much to do here. I feel uh, overwhelmed. And I think uh, control theorists could really uh, uh, make great progress here. So uh, this area needs a lot of help. <clears throat> okay, so to close, um, Let me make some remarks on abstraction and generality. Um, and, and I think these issues are driving some of the philosophy underlying directions taken in reinforcement learning research these days. So I just wanted to share these thoughts with you in case, uh, in case you haven't come across these. All right, uh, <clears throat> there's this notion that Rich Sutton calls the bitter lesson. He has a blog post about this called the bitter lesson. <clears throat> but the point is 
that you know methods become obsolete within about a decade if they don't scale with the amount of data you can gather and the amount of computation you can do. Okay. So the lesson here is to focus on methods that will get better and better as you get more data and more computation. You don't wanna be working with stylized models that are really designed for a particular amount of data and a particular amount of computation. Okay, and a natural extrapolation of this principle, if we sort of look into the future and, 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 and if we believe this, this to be true, uh, is towards <clears throat> complete abstraction away from stylized models. Okay. In fact, you know, you'd hope that you're designing methods that can produce agents which generalize across data from different problems even. Okay, so you can imagine an agent that's operating and you know, in some period of its life, it's managing a queuing network. In some period of its life, it's engaging in a dialogue with a person. And uh, in some period of its life, it's uh, engaging with the internet. And somehow, given all this data that is aggregating across all these experiences, uh, it can do much better than something designed for a particular context. Okay, that's it. So thank you. All. And sure. um, there's a few questions, one question in the chat box, uh, one question by Ms. Ren Yu Zhang. I myself also have a similar question, which is that how do you really choose the uh, electoric uh, uh, states. This is a concept for the agents, not from the environments, right? And also, how do you choose the update function so that is F and also the electoral states can have a high fidelity? Good. So I, for this particular agent today, F was a fixed function, right? And so all practical agents have a concept of aleatoric state. Um, but I think that the, it's important to actually uh, have an aleatoric state that's adapted over time. So, so you want to learn F in a sense. You don't want to use a fixed F. So, so if you think about the DQN agent that was popularized from application to uh, video games, uh, the aleatoric state used in that context was uh, eight recent uh, uh, screenshots. Okay, that was the aleatoric state. It's like that sort of, uh, would probably, that's probably enough to predict what we need to predict. The electoric state with eight recent screenshots. Oh. The, uh, then there's a mu zero agent I mentioned earlier. There, there's a uh, recurrent neural network that produces an electoric state. So the function f is a recurrent neural network and, and that's getting uh, updated over time trying to uh, improve the electoric state representation. Yeah, just be following on that. So uh, if you mentioned this can be learned uh, adaptively, it's uh, uh, on a theoretic end, how do you see uh, moving theoretically studying the case, doing the learning on, on F? Yeah. Learning F? Yeah, so the, yeah. that's a real puzzle. And I think that's one of the most important outstanding yeah. theoretical problems. Mm -hmm. So there's a paper by uh, uh, Shapiri and Rivest from, I think, 1993 uh, uh, that show, essentially shows that learning F uh, is intractable. Uh, mm -hmm. even in the simplest of cases. I see. And that paper suggests that you need a teacher to help you t tell you when, uh, when the F you're using is wrong, right? So that's one approach. But, 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 but it'd be nice to have the characterization of the extent to which you can learn F even if you can't do a perfect job. And, and I think that's a big open issue. I see. Okay, maybe we have time for one, two, one or two short questions. Is there any more questions? So I have a question. So just to understand this notion of uh, regrets that uh, you make it is what kind of guarantees that your algorithm will convert in some sense, right? It will approach some uh, nice policy to be yeah close enough to the best policy, let's say. Is that correct? 
sure what the question is. So, 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 so the, the, the regret bound we provided uh, implies that the average reward, long-term average reward experienced by the Asian converges to within 15 delta of the optimal policy for the environment. Does that answer your question? Okay. And, and, and this he grabs, it's based, uh, also have like, like the R T plus one term that is this is based on the history. So the this notion of regret is based on the rewards on the Asian. And uh, I, I'm puzzled because all this is based like the 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 rewards of the Asian and also the history is based on the Asian observation. And I'm always thinking if I put two Asians they both will have different histories. Then both would have different regrets referring to the same problem. And if both these agents are, let's say, playing in an opposite way, like when one win, the other lose, how could I guarantee that this will converge somehow? Because when the regret of one would be... I'm not saying there's any... High, the other would be. I'm not saying there's any convergence here. This is just a bound on their expected average regret. There's no, no, no convergence guarantee here. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, I guess in the interest of time, we might have to uh, stop here. I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Benjamin Barrel again for giving this wonderful talk and thank you all for participating and, uh, and also the questions. Um, yeah, so with this, let's uh, conclude here. And next week, we will have Professor Runzo Dalei uh, from MIT. So thank you all for coming and thanks